Standing on the Promises, 175. I'll open up in a word of prayer. All right. Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for each and every one who's here. We ask now for your blessings on the service. I pray, the Lord, that you would be glorified and honored in all that's said and done. We ask you to uh, visit us tonight, to be with us, to uh, open our hearts and minds, and help us to worship you. We thank you again for all that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. 175, Standing on the Promises. <clears throat> Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Page 208. 
208. Are you washed in the blood? <clears throat> out of the house we were um, we were we are very war thin so any mistakes I make tonight I, I'm just going to blame it on delusion lack of concentration and about a hundred other things um, it was a good trip it was a good time to fellowship but it was very exhausting you're going 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 all the time um, so it doesn't give you pretty much, but it's good, you know, you get to fellowship with people that you, some you don't know, um, pastors, um, all but one, you know the one that wasn't from BC, that was Pastor Harness, he was there, but the rest of them, it's a BC thing, so the rest of them are out throughout BC. The furthest one up, Williams Lake, that was, that's pretty far up, right, Williams Lake? It's south, so maybe Prince George further. So I thought there was one more that was further up, but um, it was it was it was a real good fellowship. Um, we get to like I say, get to new meet uh, pastors that you hadn't met before, and get to have uh, touch base with some people that you haven't seen in a while. Most of them I had I did not know. Um, there was uh, of course those stalwarts in the faith that you that you do know because we've met time and time again. Those that knew Brother Heron, and, and we had fellowship and talked about him some, so it was good. We, it really was. Um, he left an impression. <laughs> he left a good impression. Got to talk with um, Pastor uh, Friesen, which is now Lori and Tom's pastor, 
in a, a Valley View, Valley View Baptist Church. That's in Creston, and so that was um, that was good to be able to, to talk and fellowship with him and a man out of his church. So it really was a wonderful trip, and I appreciate that. All right, if you would go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Second Peter chapter two, we're going to um, mosey into this a little bit, and then when I um. Uh, after I get stomping on toes or whatever, we'll go to something else. <clears throat> we'll see how it works out. <clears throat> we did not get back uh, to the house. It, no, it was um, one. Uh, I remember because I was timing it from the airport when we, about one thirty-five. Um, when we got back from the airport, so it was it wasn't a bad trip. I know somebody was praying for me on those while I was on those planes. Because to be totally honest, this is the less nervous I've ever been on a plane. Now I did keep one thought in my hand in my head the whole time. I'm in the hollow of his hand, so <clears throat> I figured if that plane went down, he'd let his hands down. So. But it was it was it actually was good. It was a little bumpy going because of the um, clouds, and there was a time or two it bumped when they were landing. But other than that, it was pretty good. So praise the Lord. I didn't hear any engines cut off or sputter. That's always a good sign. So if you would go ahead and turn to chapter two, and then we go down to verse seven, and we had started talking about or had talked about, and said delivered just lot, vexed with the the filthy conversation of the wicked. Uh, we talked about uh, he was uh, vexed. Well, first of all, we talked about he was just, uh, meaning he was righteous. Uh, and we don't get that from the Old Testament. We talked about him being vexed, uh, being afflicted, being uh, uh, burdened. I, I, I tend to go with the afflicted, but it can be defined as burdened. It can be, it gives the idea that his heart was wearied. Uh, from you know the things he saw, it was just a tremendous burden, uh, an affliction for him. Not that it moved him from God, but it just it had an effect on him. Um, I don't remember that I got this far, <clears throat> but um, I know we talked about Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, were cities in which the people were open and shame their sin, their practice of moral actions. We know the stories that we've uh, read in the Bible the angels going in, but uh, Lot was still able to live righteous there. What a tremendous testimony we have. We look at our world today and we say, you know, you don't know uh, what I faced in my life. You don't know what I've been through. Well, you've not been through what Lot has been through. You may have been through close, but let's say you've been through just as much or more than he has. The same God that allowed him to live righteous, to live righteous is the God that gives you the strength to live righteous. We have no excuse. He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. So we have the strength. We have the strength of, of God Almighty. If we wish to, to tap into that, if, if we wish to live righteous, if we really desire, we can. And this is really uh, an illustration of that ability for a Christian. Do we live in a wicked world? Oh boy. I mean, it's hard to say the signs you'll see. It's hard to say any more the people you'll see and what they'll be doing. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty wicked. But no matter how wicked it is, God is stronger. Um, you know, I was thinking about that, about uh, the strength of God. And, and I, I remember talking with people back and forth, uh, several of them. Uh, well, there's been a number of things told. The, the, the biggest one probably was you don't know what I've gone through in my life. You don't know what I've suffered or whatnot. And, and I, I think about that, and, and, and some of these times it was from Christians. Uh, let me be really, really blunt about this. To say that is to say you don't know God. To say that is denying He is God. You're saying that there's something stronger than God. Anything that's stronger than God, if there is something, then it's God and He's not. God cannot have anything that is stronger than Him. So if he's indwelling us, then the strength we have, he's given us is stronger than anything, any addiction, any temptation. You understand, there is no reason. 
um, that we would fall to any of those things. I can apply that across the board in, in several things, but I believe that's a big issue um, uh, for Christianity. And, and maybe I should say Christendom and not Christianity is we have made our God small. Uh, we live in a world of men and we look at God as just another man or has the attributes of man. But that means you don't know God. That means you haven't spent time in the Word of God because the Word of God makes it very clear He is not a man as we are. His ways are not as, we, as our ways are. He thinks different. He acts different uh, because He is guided by His nature. Uh, he's guided, first of all, by being holy, holy, holy. You know, He's not like us. Um, um, he is, and just, I think it was Tozer, it may have been somebody else I, I read just the other day. It says, um, He is not in the universe. The universe is in him. And I got to thinking about that and I said, that is a real good thought. Uh, God is, is outside of everything. You know, um, when I was in college, they used to teach us um, God is not a temporal being. You understand what I'm saying there? If you don't, say no. God is not a temporal being. God uh, was, was, is not in time. He doesn't age. He's outside of time. We are temporal beings. We have a beginning and we have an end. God didn't, never had a beginning and He'll never have an end. He's outside of time. He invented time. So take this thought into mind. You have God here and He's looking down on His creation. He can see the beginning and He can see the end all at once. We don't. We see where we're at. <clears throat> and then these people say, well, you know, God is just a man. <coughs> I talked to... Um, a young man the other day who I've talked to many times before, um, talked about a week and a half ago, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and he made this statement. Uh, we were talking about God, and I said, well, you, and he was saying some things, I said, well, um, you don't believe there's a God? And he said, yeah, 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 you know, I'm not denying that. I said, well, it sounds like you are. I said, you don't think he's eternal? I said, back up a minute. I said, you don't think he's omniscient, all-knowing? You don't think he's omnipotent, all-powerful? You know, I said, you don't think he's eternal? He said, well, really, <clears throat> he said, I just think he's a very smart being. Wait a minute. <laughs> that kind of defeats the idea of God, doesn't it? And so I think that is not an uncommon mindset, whether we would live up to it and agree with it or not. But I think as we begin to examine how we deal with certain things in our life, we, you know, I'm running financially short. There's no way I can make ends meet. You know, and, and nobody can help me. Well, God can help you. You know, God has the ability to do things. And, and, and they come by ways we never... I, I, my dad used to say this a lot. He said, I'll get to praying for something, and I think the answer is coming this way. He said, turn around, and it's coming this way. And he said, it always comes in a way I never expect, and that's God. We have a, a, a vision or a focus that, that, okay, he's got the answer this way. God is not limited by our thoughts and abilities and the way we think. Because He is God. He is all-powerful. And I think when we begin to minimize God, we begin to put Him in place of man. We give Him the attributes of man. He does not have those. He's far above those. And I think we need to really back up a little bit and begin to make God God again. Now, is your God a little God? Or is He a great God? Is He the God that created the heavens and earth and everything in it? Or is he just a God that, that kind of helps you along the way when you need it? You know, Is he like that genie? You open that box up just long enough to get what you need and then you close it back up and put him in the shelf? Or is he one you live by every day? Uh, that's the difference in, in the God and, and the men and the God of gods. Um, he is the God. <clears throat> Let me ask you this question. I know, we're just bouncing around here in some kind of universe. But let me ask you this question. This, uh, this God that you don't live by every day, this God that you just open the box and ask Him things, do you really trust Him to supply your needs? If you only go to God when you really need something, when you're really desperate, are you really trusting God? Is that really trust? Is that really faith? I think to have faith is, is to trust Him in each and everything that we face in life. Now, 
I hope that when situations come up, you are, um, are in your heart and in your mind. You don't have to fall on your knees and pray, but you say, Lord, what should I do in this situation? If you have established a relationship of faith with God, in a, in a blink of an eye, he can answer your questions, direct your thoughts, and help you to achieve things, uh, understand his direction in things. Um, <clears throat> When we do not do that, take everything. They have a song about that. Take everything to him in prayer. You know, everything, everything. Um, when we don't do that, I think that's a distinct lack of, of faith. Um, let me get back on this and get off that. Um, I think we mentioned that our lives are a lot like Lot. They're vexed uh, by the filthy conversations of the wicked around us. I think um, uh, we're vexed because we are afflicted, if you would, because we are to live in this world. Um, uh, yet we have an example here of how to live righteous. You know, as I was thinking about this, and it, it talked about him being just lot, God delivered just lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Um, When I began to think about this, I uh, began to think of the, about the things we see and the people we know in this world and, and some of the, 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 the vileness that is there. And, and I, I meet people, I don't know you, but I meet people, some of them claiming to be Christians, and they don't appear to be bothered by all this that's going on. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm bothered by it. I really am. Uh, I, I, Boy, sometimes I just wish I was God. I said, I'll take care of that. Boom. You know, but God's got a purpose in it. But I am. I'm, I'm seriously bothered by it. And I think we should be as Christians. Um, I see believers. I talk with believers who are in sin, who have no shame. I talk to unbelievers who are in sin. And sometimes uh, the same magnitude, sometimes less. And they're not ashamed anyway, uh, either. And I ask myself, why are, are these two... Uh, People not ashamed. One's a believer and one's not. Well, I can understand uh, the unbeliever. I can understand why he doesn't have any shame because he shouldn't have the indwelling God. But the, the believer, um, he should have shame. Now, let me call your attention back to the verse. It says, Lot was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Go on to verse 8 for a second. It says, For that righteous man dwelleth among them, and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. <clears throat> that triggered a thought in my mind. <clears throat> Lot was righteous. <clears throat> he saw what was going on. He wasn't blind to it. The righteous have the ability to see wickedness. Would you agree with that statement? So why do we have people that proclaim to be Christians, and yet they have no shame about the sin in their life? about some of the things they say and do. Because they're living like the world. Carnal. Yeah. I talked to some, and I don't disagree with you, but I talked to some, and um, when I mentioned that those things are, are wicked, and they're like, I don't think so. Now, are they lying to me? Or do they really don't see it? You, you, you see where I'm going. I see the smirks on your face. You see where I'm going. So I, I'm left to wonder, and I, I agree, the carnal Christian does not see those things as clear as he should. But there is an indwelling God there. I think if they were reading the Bible, they should be a difference. Let's, I agree with you, but let's back up some. If they are indwelt by the Spirit of God, should they not already be able to know the difference? Because he's the one that guides us. Should he not be freaking, does, does he continually let his children go astray? Or does he start doing things to bring them back? And so when I don't see that, I have to ask myself, is this hard, heart this hardened, or is it actually an absence of Christ? You understand where I'm going? And, and this, is, this has been something that's perplexed me a lot, because, but I'm starting to get a little clarity on this, but a righteous person, God's calling him righteous. A righteous person has the ability to see between the holy and the unholy. All because of God. Now, in his day, it wasn't an indwelling. 
we have an indwelling. That's a whole new ball game altogether because he pricks us, he guides us. And if, if that person can't see, if there's no shame, by the way, that's sign language, shame. I, I keep doing it because that's what I, anyway. If there's no shame, why? Can the heart be that hardened with Christ in there? I, I can't answer that one, but I can tell you this. The unbelievers don't have any shame because there's no Christ. They can't see that. They don't see the difference between the holy and the unholy. Can the carnal get to that place? I guess they can, but to me, it would. It, I, I don't see Christ ever giving up on his children. A denial? I don't know. <clears throat> I do see um, there are people that speak of being saved, yet they have no clue of ungodly actions and, and they bring reproach. Now, uh, some of those aren't mature yet and they're growing. Some of those uh, maybe are growing slower. Uh, I can't always, I can't answer all that. This, those are things that perplex me. Uh, it says that with the filthy conversation, this is not just talk. This is talking about a lifestyle, how they live, their manner of living, if you would their deportment, if you would. Um, and so when they talk about conversation, it's not just speech. It's the way they behave themselves. And said, so, Lot was vexed. He was afflicted because of their filthy lifestyles, their manner of living. And if you don't understand that, you get around people that are vile enough. You get around people that are going the wrong way, even some Christians, and they will begin to afflict you. They will begin to, to uh, hinder your growth. Because they, they put things in your life that you don't need in there. God doesn't want in there. <clears throat> um, I'm going to visit this in a little different way real quick. Like we talked about people claiming to be saved but yet not having any clue um, uh, of some of the things they have in life being ungodly. I'm going to give you two ideas on this matter um, if they're a Christian. Uh, one is they've never seen God as holy. They've never taken the time to read the Bible. They've never ever been under uh, maybe sound preaching and teaching. They've never taken time to develop a relationship with God because as you develop a relationship with God, you're going, to be, you're going to see some things, especially through the Old Testament as far as the holiness of God and the judgment of God of those that, that, that lived uh, lives contrary. And, and when you hit the New Testament, you begin to see God as a father, less judgmental and more loving. But the Old Testament really puts down a judgmental God that um, is righteous, he's holy, he's pure, and expects his children to be. So they've never seen him. They don't know the nature and character of God. Um, they hold him because of that. And mind you what I'm telling you, if you don't understand, if you've never come to grip that God is holy, you don't understand his nature, you don't understand his character, if you don't know his attributes, you begin to hold God in low esteem. He's not high and lifted up. He's the old man upstairs or something. You understand? You don't hold that esteem. You don't have that because you don't understand who he is. You don't have a vision of his holy character. Uh, the other uh, idea I have from this is that they've never really seen themselves in the light of God. You know, you don't, we, or we don't, I want to include myself in this, we don't realize just how wicked, violent, sinful creatures we are until we begin to see God as he is. And as we view ourselves in the light of the Almighty God, and you go to Revelations and, and begin to read the description of God and then think about who he is, you know, and we begin to see ourselves. Uh, boy, I could never measure up. I could never enter in before him because I have not that ability to be righteous like that. I can't make the mark. Which, praise the Lord, that's why we have Jesus Christ. He can and did. And if we accept him, then we will. <clears throat> so with that said, I believe that's what the indwelling Christ gives people. Those two things. The ability to see God as he is and the ability to see themselves in comparison to who God is. If you don't have the indwelling, you can't see that. Um, we see him in his righteousness. So they're blinded, if you would. So 
again, we go back to 8, and, and I believe this verse helps explain some of the things I mentioned um, about the types. It says, for that righteous man. Um, the statement confirms again that Lot was righteous by God's own words. And then it tells us, he said, dwelling among them, living among these ungodly people. And then, it, it, you know, in living your life, you, you're intertwined in every area. You know, you live in a community. When you go in your house, you can be isolated some. But as you go to work or come back, as you walk, maybe you take a walk in the morning. Maybe you have to cut grass, cut the, uh, the flowers or stuff. You're out in your yard. But you begin to hear and see. and You, you go by houses. You understand the character of people. And um, in those days, there would be open markets and, and there would be less cars, you know. They didn't have cars back then. So there would be more intermingling. There would be more dependency one on another as far as neighbors. So in living together, dwelling among them, there would be more seeing, there would be more hearing, there would be more interaction. They would see their actions. They would know the temperament of the people. They would know whether they were godly or ungodly. Uh, so this was not something that really could be, be hidden as much. And today you can kind of get by and hide some things. You can keep people from knowing you're pretty, you know, if you want to stay withdrawn. In those days you had to leave. You had to get outside the city. You had to get be a hermit or something. Uh, but it was, it was not like he was blind to them. He saw them. Now, yet he continued to live there. So why? Why would you continue to vex yourself? Maybe you didn't have any place to go. You know, maybe that uh, it was profitable for him. Maybe uh, by the time he really realized and, and began to get his heart right in the manner he should with God, he had already uh, got entwined in that community. Now, why do I make that last statement? By the time he got his heart right with God, I have some validity to that. Why did I say that? When him and Abraham separated, what did Lot do? He looked up and seen the well-watered plains. Physical, materialistic, those things. And, and Abraham, by faith, followed God. So one was with the sight, one was with the things, the temporal things of this world, and the other chose to follow God. Um, and his path was not always easy. So. I think that in the beginning, Lot may have been more uh, physically oriented. And, and we all are at times. You know, we want to accomplish certain things, and, and that's what he saw. Well-watered plains, green grass. I can take my, my uh, sheep there or whatever I'm going to raise. It's going to be easier on me. I won't have to struggle in the wilderness. Less animals. You, you understand? And so he went that route. So that's why I say that. Um, maybe he was... Uh, got there and got entwined. It was just easy living. It's easier to stay. You know, any of you ever moved? Packed up and moved? It's kind of easier to stay where you are and move, isn't it? And just think of all those sheep. Uh, he didn't have U-Haul. You know, he had um, a hammer, some long tent spikes, some 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 skins probably, and, and maybe when he got to over here to this uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, whichever city he was in, Maybe he had a nice home. Now, I don't think he had no AC in the, in, the, in the window, but he might have a nice breeze coming. You know, more comfortable. I don't have to put this tent up. I don't have to keep moving. I got well-watered plains. Boy, I can just, you know, I can stay right here. It's easier to do. And so, yeah, up, just tearing your roots up and moving is, is tough. And it doesn't matter how far you go. Um, I know I've done that lately. So it becomes easier more comfortable we get to live among the wicked. We begin to overlook things. We begin to allow those things to affect us. And, and, and do you remember what Lot said when they, when they cast him out of the city? The angels drug him out. Do you remember what he said about Zoar? Z-O-A-R was the city. No? It's just a little one. You, you know, and he was going to, you know, we understand he destroyed the cities of the plains, and we see Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm wondering if there's not more. I'm wondering if Zoar wasn't going to be one of those that was destroyed too. But Lot said, you know, can I go there? And he said, go to the mountains. He said, I, but can I go to Zoar? It's just a, a little city. We say that, you know. You know, I, I see what they're doing, but, you know, 
It's just a little thing. It's not a big deal. Little things grow into big things, you know. And you, you allow those things to take root in your heart. They dim your eyes, you accept them, and then what happens? Then it's something else. Well, you know, that's just a little thing too. See, the little things keep adding up. You add enough little things together, you get a forest fire. You know what that is, right? And what happens with the forest fires? You get, they destroy. They consume everything in their path. They get smoke out. Makes it dangerous for other people. They give out uh, harmful fumes. It also makes it uh, deadly for some to breathe. And can, You understand, there's other things that come out of sin. There these little things, they grow. They put forth other things that, that disrupt other lives. Uh, and can draw them away from God as well. Um, I wonder when it talks about him being afflicted. It says he was a righteous man. It says he, he saw and he heard. So he had that discernment. And, and these things vexed him. They afflicted his soul, his righteous soul today. Listen. Daily he saw the things. Daily he allowed them to continue in his presence. Daily he continued to live. And daily these things affected him. How long can you stand being afflicted by ungodly things without them affecting your life? Let's put it this way. The Bible tells us that, that light or Lot was righteous. But what happened to his children? Two come out of there. The rest of them were destroyed. They were married into that wickedness. Okay? What did those two do after they come out? Those things had already affected, and I'm not going to get into that. That's not the lesson. I, but you understand, they had already affected their thinking very gravely. Maybe it wasn't visible on the outside, but it did come out in their actions. You know, they look pretty good. You know, i got pretty good kids. I've heard people say that before. And then I've seen those kids where the parents weren't. I, I take this and I, I think about uh, those Christians. Um, well, let me re rephrase that. Those that are unsaved, they don't have, they've never been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. They don't have the indwelling spirit. And th they read the Bible. Uh, they'll never understand the teaches, teachings of the Bible. They'll never see their sin as God sees their sin. But we should. We should as we read. It should, it should stand out to us. Um, why do the unsaved never feel the weight of their sin as they're living in this world? Lack of conviction? It is, but there's a reason why they have that lack. It's really, it's probably unfair of me to ask. When we accept Jesus Christ, we get the light. They're still living in darkness. They have no clue. They don't see it because there's no light on it. Um, and so until they get that light. But Lot did. And it did affect him. And it did affect his family. Um, continuously. Uh, it says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust until the day of punishment to be punished. You know, we go back to 7, and he said, he, and he delivered um, just Lot. He rescued him out of this. Um, let's think about that for a minute. What did Lot lose when he was rescued? What did he lose when he was rescued out of this environment? His family. Say again. His wife. He lost... Uh, and I forget how many children, I, if, if I even knew. Two kids come out, but he had others in there. He lost his wife. So he lost a lot of things that was very dear to him. He could have lost grandkids. It was a heavy price to pay to have gone toward those well-watered plains. But it says God knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. He knows how to do this out. The, the problem I find is most of us don't want deliverance. We get very happy, you know. I enjoy this. Um, 
I, I can remember several things in, in my life that I really enjoyed doing. And, and finally, the Lord spoke my heart and he said, no, you're not supposed to enjoy that. You're not supposed to be involved in that. And we're all at different stages and God leads in different ways. But he knows how to deliver us. He knows how to put his finger on those things. Um, when it says he knows how to deliver, was there any other way he could have brought Lot out? Or did he have to bring him out that way? Would Lot have separated from that wickedness if God had not acted in the way he acted? He had plenty of opportunities to leave. And he never left. I think it's fair to assume that um, it's highly unlikely that he would have. God had to make a very drastic change in his life. Did it work for the better for Lot? You know, sometimes God does a lot to change our way of thinking. And what we do is get angry. You know, I, I, in Lot's case, I'm not going to go any further than that. Because it's kind of, there's, there's a lot there. And I don't think I could actually do him justice tonight on that. Uh, if I ever could. Uh, but God knows how to deliver him. Got him out of that temptation. You got to understand something. When the, you, it's, it's everything we do is by choice. I've, I've mentioned this not too long ago. You can choose this path or that path. Once you choose a path, it becomes easier or harder to serve the Lord, depending on what your choice is. And he chose a path that began to ingrain him into a society, into a city that was wicked. And the further he got ingrained, and when I say ingrained, he got in there, he rose his kids, they married in. That's getting ingrained. That's getting your roots down. And the further you get in there, they have grandkids then. How hard is it to get yourself out? The further you get ingrained in the sinful ways, the further you allow things to get into you, the more it will grow and the more painful it is and the more harsh God's deliveries may have to be. And you have to accept that. And then what happens then? So God delivers you. You know, you get angry at God or you praise the Lord. Well, you, well, I lost so much. You know, God was unfair to me. He didn't ever, he, you just don't know what he, oh, wait a minute. We're going down that, you, you see where I'm going. You go down that path again? When God delivers you, I don't care how painful it is, you better learn to praise the Lord for it. Because if you don't praise the Lord for what he's done, if you can't see what he's getting you out of, here's what's going to happen. You're going to make the wrong choice again, aren't you? And you're going to start getting grained again. And you're not going to learn the lesson God wants you to learn. You're not going to draw close to him where he wants you to get. You know, there's not a thing that will happen in your life that you cannot praise the Lord for. Not one thing. And, and I always go back to that verse, Romans 8, 28. For all things work to good that love him. Right? But here's the catch. It doesn't say all things are good. <laughs> you know, one day you're going to have some things happen. You know, you may lose your parents. You may you know, lose uh, loved ones or whatever. It's things are going to happen that are not good. You know, there'll be sad occasions. There'll be grievous occasions. They're not good. But God says they can work for good. What makes the difference? I've already given you the answer, by the way. It's your choice. To praise God or to be angry at God. You choose that path. You choose how that will affect. Will it be good for you? If you praise the Lord. If you learn to understand that everything He does is right. And He wants to grow you. Make you a better Christian. Any questions? I'm going to stop right there because some of you are feeling like I'm feeling. I see. Well, I'll tell you what. You could have peeled me off the floor. I was tired. Vera was just as tired. I had to drag her out the door. <laughs> One of us is always dragging another. So, hey, just the way it works. Go ahead. You let glad I said that, aren't you? One of us is always dragging another. Praise the Lord for help me.